The New York Giants wrap up their spring football program. What did we learn about them this spring? I'm going to give you my takes coming up next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. I'm your host, Patricia Trena, and we're here, folks. We made it to the end of the spring. The New York Giants wrapping up their two-day mandatory minicamp. Now, today they're going to have a cookout, which is basically a team-building activity, but the football part is done for the time being, six weeks off, and then it's off to training camp at the Quest Diagnostics Training Center. And on today's episode of the Locked on Giants podcast, I'm going to cover things that we learned this spring about the New York Giants. So I have some takeaways that I'm going to do, not just on, you know, the mandatory minicamp day two, which really there wasn't a whole lot to talk about in terms of football, but I'm talking more or less larger picture type things. So I've got a few things on my list that we're going to talk about. Things we learned about the New York Giants this spring. So let us get right into it, shall we? All right. Item number one. This was a big one for me, I think. This team has depth at a lot of critical positions. Now, last year, if you think back to, you know, the season when injuries started happening, the defensive line lost depth, which required Leonard Williams and Uh, Dexter Lawrence to have to play a lot, probably more than they should have. That wasn't a good thing. The cornerback depth really wasn't there. You know, that limited what Wink Martindale could do. The receivers, you know, even though Mike Kafka got a whole lot out of the receivers that, you know, people just weren't expecting, really not, you know, anything special per se. They got the job done, but nothing, you know, to where you could say, oh, wow, you know, they're, they're setting the world on fire. So. Joe Shane, general manager, went out this past offseason, and he added depth at those positions that were lacking last year. And let's start real quick with the receiver core. The receiver core now has about, I think, 13 or 14 guys listed on the roster. They all have different skill sets, can all do different things. And one of the things we saw in the OTAs and the mandatory minicamp was that the coaches weren't afraid to mix things up a little bit and align guys in different positions. So, for example, you saw Paris Campbell working from the slot. Darius Slayton got a few snaps from the slot. You saw Paris Campbell in the backfield. You saw, you know, a lot of pre-snap motion where guys were just moving around. Darren Waller, who's, you know, a tight end, not a receiver, he was in the backfield. Daniel Bellinger, tight end, he was working as an H-back. So basically, you know, the depth has now allowed the coaching staff, in this particular case, Mike Kafka, to try different things. And why is that important, folks? Because now the Giants can play matchup football as opposed to let's just go with, you know, who we've got. And that was a problem last year. Let's think about it for a minute. How many times did we watch a game and we said to ourselves, gosh, you know, Darnay Holmes, for example, looks overmatched and, you know, he had a bad game because he just wasn't matched up properly against, you know, the slot receiver of the the, uh, opposing team. Well, now they've got depth at key positions. You know, I mentioned cornerback. They have that they have that depth at cornerback as well, especially at slot cornerback to where now they can play matchup football. And that's so important if the Giants want to close the gap between themselves and the Cowboys and the Eagles. You know, you can look at the talent level and you can say, oh, the Giants just, they're not there yet. And nobody will probably argue with with you on that. I mean, they're getting there. They're a lot better than they were this time last year. But the mere fact that now they can play matchup football So if, for example, the Cowboys put a huge tight end as their slot receiver, it's no longer Darnay Holmes versus that guy. You know, it's going to be 
maybe Aaron Robinson, who's a bigger, you know, bodied slot receiver, or maybe Cordell Flott, who, by the way, did add a little bit bulk. I know a lot of you asked me about Cordell Flott. So the Giants can get better matchups. And when you can play matchup football, you have a better chance of winning. So that was a really, really big takeaway. And one of the things that I think Joe Shane sought to do with this roster as he built it up. Now, do they have enough depth at every position? We'll find out. Um, you can't address everything in one off season, but certainly you got to feel better about the depth the Giants added at receiver, at cornerback, at linebacker, on the defensive line, which was a big problem last year. Don't have to tell you that. Um, the interior of the offensive line, just so much better. And um, the coaches now have options to do more of what they want versus what the talent kind of dictates them to do. So we'll see how that plays out once we get into the summer, what they keep from the spring versus what they throw away. But overall, that depth allowing them to play matchup football is huge. Okay, another thing we learned about this team, speed on both sides of the ball. That's right. Now, if you want to keep up with the Cowboys and the Eagles, you better have speed on both sides of the ball. The Giants really didn't have that last year. So we'll start with the offensive side of the ball. How often do we remember the Giant receivers streaking down the field, getting open, getting separation? Wasn't really often that that happened. So now they've got guys who can do that. If they stay healthy, they've got guys that can streak down the field, that can stick, you know, that can uh, separate from defenders and make catches. They've got guys who can, you know, make contested catches, which they didn't really have. Um, on the other side of the ball, at cornerback, the defensive backfield, it, even the linebackers, they've got guys who can run and cover. So that's going to help them tremendously because all too often last year, how many times did we see them, you know, a, a giant defender get blown past by uh, an opponent? A little too often, I think. So they've added speed um, that should allow them to compete within the division because, as I've said many times, if you are not winning the division, games, you probably won't go too far in the playoffs. So the Giants addressing speed on both sides of the ball, which was very important. And we saw that speed during the spring. We saw, you know, a lot of more deep passing on the offensive side. We saw um, better coverage by the defensive backs, you know, even though we don't know who the starting four will be, but you could see the difference in the speed, you know, Bobby O'Karake, they added him at linebacker and he's, you know, showed good coverage skills. So I think it'll make a difference for the giants. All right. What else did the, did we learn about the New York giants in the off season? I've got a few more on my list and I'll tell you about them right after this. Hey, giant fans get in on all the sports action with FanDuel America's number one sports book. Right now, FanDuel is giving new customers a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500 back in bonus bets if their first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and sign up today to claim your no-sweat first bet. FanDuel offers great promotions, a safe and secure app to set your bets, and instant payouts. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NFL. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Chena. Many camps over, the spring football is over. So we're talking about takeaways, my takeaways on what we learned from, about the New York Giants this spring. And um, before I get into the next group that I have for you, just real quick, as you are watching the show, uh, if you are watching it on Thursday, the 15th, Locked On Giants Live returns tonight. Trana, Tana, and Dog. Well, at least Trana and Tana for sure. Dog, I'm not sure if he's going to make it, but um, I haven't heard back, but hopefully he'll be able to make it. We've got so much to talk about and it's been such a long time. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for the live show. That'll be on the YouTube channel. So come by if you can. We're going to start around 730. We'll go a couple of hours or however long, you know, 
the moon takes us and we'll talk about all things giants. We'll take your questions and just have a great old time because it's been so long. All right. Other topics I've got coming up for you on the Locked on Giants podcast. I want to talk about um, remaining questions for this team as they head into the summer. What are some of the questions they have that we'll be looking for in the next few weeks and training camp and whatnot? So we'll talk about that. Um, I'm hoping to have Coach Gene Clemens on as we kind of break down where the Giants are at currently on the roster. Emery Hunt, I'm working to get him on a show. So these are some things that are going to happen next week. And uh, speaking of next week, um, a lot of you, I asked a lot of you what you thought or what you would like to see as far as the frequency of shows here. And a lot of you encouraged me to take some time off and not work so hard so that I'm rested for uh, for the training camp tr- grind. So we'll play it by ear each week. If you know, Some weeks I might give you five shows. Some weeks I might do three. Some weeks I might do um, four. So we'll play it by ear, but uh, I will take a day off here and there. I promise you so that I don't get burnt out. So thanks to everybody who gave me feedback on that. I appreciate it. I mean, look, we're all family. I do this for you guys and gals, and I appreciate the feedback. So, you know, those of you who, who gave it, appreciate you. All right. Let's get back to what we learned about, or actually what I learned about the New York Giants this spring. New tweaks being made to the offense, especially to the offensive side of the ball. Defense too, but I want to talk about the offense in particular. And I mentioned how different players were lining up in positions that we didn't really see them line up in previous years. And this is what I like about this coaching staff. It's, you know, just to to kind of give you um, a frame of reference, in writing, um, we often have a phrase called carving up the buffalo. And I know that sounds kind of, you know, animal cruel and whatnot, but basically what that means is um, when we have, for example, a transcript, you have to look at the transcript and basically carve it up to get as many stories as you can out of the transcript. So sometimes you might get, you know, two stories out of a transcript. Sometimes there might be three, sometimes there just might be one. The idea though, is to carve out all the good parts and present them as stories. And it's also something we try and do, you know, uh, in podcasting. So the coaching staff in, in terms of their deployment of their personnel this spring, basically took that same approach. They tried guys out at different positions that you wouldn't have imagined that they would try out. Like, you know, I mentioned before, Daniel Bellinger working as an H back, you know, Nick McLeod, who's been working exclusively as safety. Um, Paris Campbell working a lot as a slot receiver, doing some work out of the backfield. Darren Waller even lining up as out of the backfield. So that's a good thing. And the reason why it's a good thing, because you don't know what you're going to have unless you try it. And I've said many times that the spring is a time to experiment. That is when the coaches will sit down and they'll say, okay, you know what? We, We want to do this. We want to try this, that, and the other thing. Let's see how it works. So they got an opportunity to put the stuff on film. They're going to evaluate it and come, you know, the the weeks before training camp, they're going to sit down and say, okay, you know what? Maybe this look didn't work, but we're going to try this look instead because it looks like, you know, it has promise to it. So the coaches really did a good job of optimizing the talent they had this spring and checking out every possible angle. That's what you want to do. You don't want to go in and, and limit a guy. You know, you don't want to say, oh, you know, Darren Waller's too big or to, to do, um, you know, to, to, to be in the slot, for example. You don't want to say that. You want to see what they look like in different scenarios. And that's what the coaches did. And we saw a lot of interesting stuff, you know, not just on the offensive side, but on the defensive side as well. You know, we saw different uh, defensive alignments when they did the team drills, which, by the way, were run at. Um, walk through speed because they did it without the helmets. We saw um, pre-snap motion on offense, probably more pre-snap motion than I think we saw all of last year in regular season games. So there were a lot of different looks. And, you know, one of the reasons why I just, you know, didn't really record a lot of that stuff, you know, at least for public, you know, dissemination 
is because what's going to show up and what's not. And that's what I really want to focus on when we get to training camp. I want to really be able to hone in on that. And because, you know, Brian Dable is always good, you know, before practice, he'll say, okay, guys, we're going to work on this, this, and this. So now you have a, a general idea of what to look for. for so um, as far as formations and stuff like that, and you can kind of tie it all together as you're watching practice. So we'll see what carries over into the summer, what doesn't, but really a lot of new tweaks that, you know, I don't remember seeing last year. And this is probably because A, this is year two of the um, offense and defense, and B, they have some new talent with some unique skill sets that can maybe help them do more things. So we'll have to see how that all plays out. Like I said, once we get to summer training camp. All right. The other thing that we learned about the Giants is we got some insight into the health update of certain players. All right. Now there were a group of players that didn't practice this spring because they weren't clear. They're still rehabbing or whatever uh, from off season procedures, you know, guys like DJ Davidson, who had the torn ACL Sterling Shepard, who's still, you know, working his way back from an ACL Wandale Robinson, a Sean Robinson, you know, a whole bunch of guys, which by the way, you know, open things up for other guys to try. But anyway, some of the key health updates we got. Um, Shepard spoke to the media on Tuesday, and he said that he is on schedule, maybe even a little ahead of schedule. And on Wednesday, Shepard was actually running routes, and he was cutting, which was nice to see. Now, you know, obviously it was done without pads, without any kind of resistance, but it's a step in the right direction for Shepard. And Shepard said his goal is to be ready by the start of the season, which leads me to believe he probably will start training camp on PUP. That would not surprise me if he starts training camp on PUP. But uh, the fact that he was able to get out there, move around, look, you know, as comfortable as, as you know, as ever, very positive sign for Sterling Shepard, who's looking to go out on his own terms and not on an injury. Um, another big update we got, and this is important, I think, as well. Leonard Williams spoke about his neck injury. Now, if you remember at the end of last year, he was dealing with a painful neck injury that really limited him. And the pounding that he constantly took didn't help. So Leonard Williams did, you know, said uh, today. Wednesday, that he didn't need surgery, that he rested uh, the the injury. He worked on um, exercises to kind of, you know, strengthen his neck. He was doing shrugs and, you know, different types of neck exercises to strengthen that area. He mentioned that he'll probably wear a neck roll for protection moving forward. But he also said that his neck is fine, that, you know, all the work he did in the off season to rest it and to do these strengthening exercises worked. So that's a big update. That was something, you know, I had wondered about, and I'm glad the question got asked today, actually, um, because I wondered if perhaps the reason why the Giants didn't do anything with Leonard Williams's contract about extending it was due to that neck injury. And we found out that that is not the case. Okay. A couple of others, Daniel Bellinger, mentioned that he still sees the eye doctor about his eye, that freaky eye injury that he had uh, midpoint last year. So he should be okay. Um, he's going to continue to wear a visor, but uh, you know, look no worse for the wear, you know, Daniel Bellinger who, who's sporting, you know, the baby Hulk type of physique these days. Um, he should be good to go um, with no setbacks or concerns about the eye injury. Joshua Zudu, another guy who's going to be competing for the left guard position. He had the season ending neck shoulder stinger injury last year. He's fine. So the health in the health status of a lot of these guys, very positive, the health report. Um, there was a brief scare during Wednesday's workout when a Dory Jackson appeared to tweak his left ankle but he got up and he was fine. And quite honestly, anything that anybody might've, you know, tweaked or aggravated during the spring. And I can't imagine a lot of guys 
would have any kind of injuries because there was no contact, you know, things weren't run at full speed, but any lingering stuff, I think a lot of those guys will be ready for the start of camp. The two that I anticipate starting on, on pup are Shepard and Wandale Robinson. I wonder if maybe DJ Davidson is going to start on pup. And I wonder where a Sean Robinson is going to be. Um, but I don't think we're going to have a lot of guys who, you know, won't be ready for the start of training camp. They might be limited at first, but, you know, as long as they pass the physical, they'll be on the field. Okay. Um, We also learn about some position switches. Most notably, I mentioned Nick McLeod. That's going to be key because, you know, look, you've got a competition brewing in the defensive backfield. The only two spots that are firmly set Adore Jackson at one cornerback spot and Xavier McKinney at one safety spot. We are assuming that Deontay Banks will take the other cornerback spot. Deontay Banks, of course, being the first round draft pick this year. Nick McLeod has been working at safety exclusively after working all last year at cornerback. Nick McLeod trying to become, you know, this year's version of Julian Love, you know, the duct tape, the guy that can line up anywhere you need him to. So we'll see how that works out for him. Um, But, you know, that's just one example of, like I said, guys who are trying different positions out. You know, Wink Martindale always talks about his positionless defense. And I think you're going to start to see that on offense too, with some of the, you know, especially with some of the receivers and the tight ends, you know, gone are going to be the days of, you know, for example, Daniel Bellinger strictly lining up as an inline tight end. He could line up now as an H back. He could line up in the slot, line up out wide. I mean, there's going to be different ways they can deploy these guys. So that's going to be fun to keep an eye on. Because again, that goes back to the, you know, experimenting that the coaches did this past off season, and they did a lot of it. So we'll see what they keep, what they don't keep. And with the stuff that they do keep, what is it going to look like as far as the play design and personnel packages and the situations that they use it in. So all that is still to come and uh, it's going to be exciting for sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, I have a few listener submitted questions that I want to answer because they've just been sitting in my inbox for you know a few days now. And I don't want you to think I forgot about you. So don't go anywhere. I'll have your answers right after this. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. You got Patricia Trainer here. And I just ran through what we learned about the New York Giants this spring. Really, you know, bigger picture stuff as opposed to, you know, who looked good, who didn't, who's lining up where. That's all still to be determined because the coaches, like I said, they experimented with different looks and different personnel and different responsibilities and whatnot. So what we saw in the spring doesn't necessarily mean that's what we're going to see in the summer, what we're going to see in in training camp, uh, the preseason and the regular season. So, you know, just rather than, you know, bog you down with those details, we'll carry stuff over. And, And by the way, when I get to training camp and I start talking about this stuff, I'll mention if it was, you know, something we saw in the spring or not. Um, so I'll keep, I got you covered for that. Um, now, before I get to some listener submitted questions, I got to give a shout out to my everydayers, my newcomers and everybody in between. Uh, love you guys. I also want to thank those of you who have signed up for the subtext program, which is basically, um, my way of sending out text alerts to you when something happens. So if we have breaking news and I'm not by my computer, um, I can quick get a text out to you guys with breaking news. Um, I can also communicate with you guys through text messaging. And I've been doing that with several of you who have been nice enough to write back to me um, and ask questions and whatnot. So it's really a great program that we're running. Details are in the show notes. Um, It's normally $4.99 a month. What we're doing is we're giving you a free 14-day trial. And if you like it, you just continue. If you don't like it, you cancel and you owe nothing, no obligation whatsoever. Um, And because we're entering the dead period over the next couple of months, I'm running a special. It's two for one. So you get two months for the price of one. You pay $2.50 per month instead of $4.99 a month. And that works with the 
promo code P train P T R A I N. All right. That's the, the hashtag I always use when I tell you to send me your Twitter questions and whatnot P train. So please check it out again, no obligation, 14 days free to try it. Um, once we get into training camp, the text messages will probably be flowing a lot more um, than they are over the next few months. So again, it's two for one type of deal. Um, and I hope you'll check it out. So uh, if you have any questions, just hit me up. But um, that's the program we're running. Now, speaking of questions, let me get to some of the questions that um, my listeners have submitted um, to close out the segment of Locked on Giants. This one comes from Christopher White, who asks about Ellerson Smith. Uh, what is Smith's injury situation and prognosis? And do the coaches front office still see meaningful near-term potential? Or is he just a play, placeholder awaiting the first round of cuts this year? All right, Chris, thank you for the question. Ellerson Smith is, uh, I he didn't really stand out in the workouts, but again, it's kind of unfair to say that, oh my gosh, you know, this guy's a bust. But here's what I will tell you. They do hope to have him in some of the sub packages. He is, as far as I know, healthy and going to be ready to go for training camp. I don't know if he's going to be fully ready, meaning, you know, will he be on a pitch count? Possibly, but he's been, you know, doing his thing. Um, but here's the bottom line. The young man has to stay on the field and he hasn't been able to do that, you know, as you know, for the first few years of his NFL career. This is a make or break year for Ellerson Smith, because let's think about this for a second. He had his final year of college eligibility wiped out because of the pandemic. Then he comes to the Giants after declaring early and he barely gets on the field and his season ends early because of an injury. Then last year, he has another injury. All right. At some point, if you can't get on the field and stay on the field, team's going to move on. Now, they do think that Ellerson Smith has potential to help with the pass rush. He did as of last year. I remember him, you know, standing out and flashing. And I remember writing that down in, you know, both the spring and also in the summer. But then the injury happened. So, We'll have to see how it plays out, but I don't think the coaches are are taking the approach of, "Eh, he's just another training camp body. I suspect that he might be in competition with O'Shane Zimenez for the final roster spot, depending on how many they keep at outside linebacker with maybe whoever loses that competition going to the practice squad. But, um, yeah, this is a big year for him, no question. And um, hopefully, you know, he can make the most of it because he does have talent. He does have, you know, a quick first step. He needed to get a little bit bigger up top, which he did. He needed to to do a little bit better job with his base and with anchoring, which from what I understand, he's done. But it doesn't mean anything if he can't stay on the field. So, Chris, fingers crossed for Ellerson Smith. He's a good guy. Hopefully um, he can get the Giants some quality pass rushing snaps. Now, how he does against the run, we'll need to see once, you know, the pads go on. But pass rushing, I think he can get them some quality snaps. Thank you for the question. All right, we have one more question on the segment. This one from Retired Ron. Ron, long time no here, my friend. So glad to see you show up again in my inbox. So Ron wants to know, uh, he says, I was curious as to why, given the surplus of tweener edge rushers such as Zimenez, Ellerson Smith, Taman Fox, Baldano, et cetera, none of which are considered possible, none of which are considered as possible position switches to the mic position, possibly even Jihad Ward, all have the prerequisite size for the position. Uh, and then he goes on to say, I play, I personally played both middle and outside linebacker in college and through, and though the positions are different, if one possesses enough speed, the switch should be doable. Um, you know what, Ron, that's a good question. Um, obviously the, the more versatile you can be, the better, but college is a little different than the pro level. So, you know, 
you would think theoretically that, oh, you know, if you've got speed, you should be able to play both. But there's also, you know, range, there's instincts, there's, you know, strength, there's all kinds of different things. And, you know, depending on the coaching philosophy, sometimes guys, um, you know, want different qualities in their outside linebackers and their inside linebackers. You know, you mentioned Jihad Ward. I don't know that Jihad Ward has the build for, for the middle. He's more of an outside guy um, and a defensive end type. You know, same thing with um, with Zimenez. You know, and Zimenez, by the way, he struggled against the run. You know, it, it's like when they, whenever he was out there on the edge, more often than not, opponents ran right at him. So, you know, size, having the requisite size and all that stuff, is great, but you also got to have the strength. You got to have the skill set, and not everybody has that, Ron. So that's probably why they didn't think to convert some of these guys. So yeah, i I think they're I think they have um, what they need at inside linebacker, assuming everybody stays healthy. Okereke obviously is going to be an every down linebacker. Um, Micah McFadden whom, you know, Wink Martindale said has improved, you know, he's been, he got a lot of, you know, looks with the first team and, and the second team um, defenses during the OTAs and mandatory mini camp practices we were at. Um, Darian Beavers is still coming back from, from that torn ACL. He's going to get a long look. Carter Coughlin's going to get a look. Cam Brown will probably get some snaps. Uh, Gerard Davis, who's been nursing some kind of ailment, um, he'll get some snaps. I think they'll be okay at inside linebacker. Um, so, you know, it's the outside linebacker where, you know, you want to see a little bit better production in terms of finishing the pass rush. And um, yeah, I, I don't think moving some of those guys to inside linebackers necessarily the way to go, but thanks for the question. As always, don't be a stranger, Ron. <laughs> don't be a stranger. All right, let me see if we have one more. Yes, we do. All right, Andrew G checks in with me and he has a question about Saquon Barkley. Um, if Saquon decides to gamble on himself this year and play on the tag and the Giants don't tag him again, don't you think it's a bad gamble because won't the 2024 running back market be the same or possibly even lower? Are there indications that the running back market going back up to what Barkley wants in the 15 million range in 2024? Okay. Couple things there, Andrew. First off, we don't know for sure what Barkley wants APY. And I've told you guys this a million times. Don't get hung up on the APY because that's not a true number. You know, Daniel Jones has a 40 million APY, but it's really closer to 36. Five, I think it is the number because the inflated number comes from incentives. The important number, Andrew, is the guaranteed money. That's what's important. And just as the Giants did with Daniel Jones, when they gave him uh, at least a guaranteed money, which was the equivalent of the sum of the franchise tag for the quarterback position this year and next year, plus they tacked on a little bit extra for Daniel. That's what they need to do with Saquon. And I think if they can do that, they will be okay. Uh, they'll be able to get a deal done with Saquon. You know, maybe get a three-year deal with, with an out after two years. I think that's what they're looking to do. Now, you, you ask about gambling. Yes, it's a gamble. You know, I mean, God forbid Saquon, you know, plays on the tag this year and gets hurt. You know, let's say, God forbid, Knock on wood that this doesn't happen. He pops his Achilles or, or hurts his ACL or suffers some kind of serious injury. Then next year, he's he's basically screwed. <laughs> he's not going to get anything close to, you know, what he might think he's worth. So yes, it is a gamble, and this is why, by the way, Andrew, it would behoove him and his agent to come to an agreement on a multi-year deal by that July 17th deadline. And I, you know, I know I've been saying on this show that I question whether or not that's going to happen. I have that. I have a feeling he's going to play on the tag. And in recent days, 
you know, after being in the building and talking to a few people, I do think they're going to get something done by the 17th. The way I kind of see this playing out right now, there's no rush to sign right now for several reasons. Number one, if you're Saquon's agent, if you sign right now, then it looks like you might be leaving something. You know, people are going to wonder, did you leave money on the table in the negotiations? So really with negotiations, oftentimes they go down to the, the wire. You know, anybody who signs right away, there, there's a question of, did you leave something on the table? So if you're sick one's agent, you want to make sure that you are getting every last penny you can for your client. That's what she's, that's why she's hired. You know, that's, that's what her job is. So listening to Saquon on Sunday, you know, after he spoke um, at his youth football camp, I kind of walked away with the impression that, okay, come July 17th, hopefully the two sides are closer. Hopefully Saquon is getting what he wants, but if he has to give up a little bit here and there, and the Giants have to give a little bit more here and there, I get the impression that it's going to come together. And if you are Saquon, by the way, it behooves you to sign a multi-year deal versus the franchise tag. Because if, if you sign that franchise tag, like I said, and you get injured, you're screwed next year. You're absolutely screwed. If you sign a multi-year deal that has guaranteed money this year and next year, and you suffer the same injury, now you've got a little bit of more financial security. So yeah, I, I, it is a gamble to, to go on the, on the franchise tag, but I am starting to think that will not come into play. I feel a lot better about where things are headed. Now, I know um, the rap sheet of, over at the NFL Network said initially that, you know, the, the uh, last offer the Giants made was back on the table. And then he later walked that back and said, no offers on the table yet, but the two sides are talking that's good news. Better that they be talking than not talking. So, you know, is this a feeling out process where, you know, the Giants are feeling out Kim Miali and Saquon Barkley as to what they want and, and vice versa? Yes. And that's productive. And hopefully those talks will lead to something getting done by the 17th. I feel better about it right now. So we'll just have to see if, if you know, that hunch comes to, to fruition, but basically check back with me on July 17th, because as we get closer to that date, that's when I think something is going to break. It's, it's going to happen one way or the other. So, all right, giant fans, that's going to do it for this edition of the locked on giants podcast. Thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day, or if watching on YouTube, your first watch of the day, make sure you tune in. Um, if you're watching this on Thursday, make sure you tune in tonight, 7.30. Again, the live show with yours truly and Tana and hopefully Bad Dog will be able to join us. It's been a long time. We miss you guys. We miss the live chat. So hopefully you'll, you'll swing by and uh, just keep on checking us out here on the Locked on Giants podcast. I'll try and bring you as much content as I can to fill in the break uh, before training camp. And also don't forget to check me out on Giants Country where we have plenty more um, if, you know, articles and, and whatnot coming up. So thank you for tuning in. For those of you we see on Thursday night, I'll see you later. For those of you we see tomorrow, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Take care, giant fans.